There's more to Holland than Hans Brinker, and we'll tell you why this week on Motoring 2004. PSN's Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. Ah, beautiful Amsterdam, lots of things to see and do. Of course, let's not forget that red light district and the infamous coffee shops with that wacky tobacco. But we're not here to look at those. We're here to talk about tires. Now, don't touch that dial. I know when most people hear tires, their eyes begin to glaze over, despite the fact that tires, without a doubt, are the most important safety component on our vehicles today. But here's a little tire trivia for you. About 162 companies actually produce tires on this planet each year, but seven of them control 85% of the market and it makes you wonder how the others survive on that 15%. Well one of the survivors is actually located right here in Holland. The Vredestein Tire Company has been producing replacement tires since about 1947 and this week they invited some Canadian automotive journalists to check out its factory and also tell us that despite a very crowded market this company sees Canada as an opportunity for growth. Uh, Fredersen is a Dutch company. Uh, we are uh, building tires since more than 50 years, 55 years now. Uh, our main market is Europe. Uh, the tires we are building is personal car tires, uh, commercial van tires and tires for the agriculture. 90% of our business is exported outside Holland. Um, and some of that business is uh, exported outside Europe. Uh, one of our growing uh, markets is the US and Canada. Present Tire is a uh, wholesaler in Canada and we operate a network of 172 store across Canada and uh, we specialize in passenger and light truck tires and uh, during uh, the last couple of years we were always looking for something that was extraordinary or better than the average product that we could get on the market and uh, basically we turned around and uh, found that uh, Vredestein, uh, a Dutch tire maker, uh, was not heavily distributed in Canada and we thought that uh, it would be a uh, golden opportunity for us and that we would be able to compare it to the known North American product that we do sell at the same time but we would have a better offer for the market for the Canadian consumer. We spend a lot of attention on the look of the tire because we think that a tire, of course, has to be good. That's the basic uh, condition. But uh, a, a tire is, is, is an, a product which is uh, not only, uh, you know, in the buying decision, there is not only the ratio, but there's also the emotion. And we want to add the emotion to the rational uh, thing behind it. Very seldom it is sold uh, as a safety product. You, know, you just buy it, it's sold as a commodity. A tire is not a commodity. You can have all kinds of safety devices in your car, but if your tires don't do the job, you have a problem. I'm now 12 years with Fredestan, thing, but long before that, Fredestan built uh, automatic assembling machines for personal car tires. The cycle's time, for instance, is 32 seconds. It is an amazing uh, machine. Uh, we have six of those. Uh, it's three stores high, it's, a, it's, a, it's really an incredible machine. Um, it allows us to be competitive uh, with lower cost countries. It has the big advantage that we can produce constant quality. We really believe in 
automated and semi-automated uh, manufacturing methods. Today, uh, people, uh, the connoisseur, they are more and more uh, traveling on the internet and they're uh, seeking information. So they become uh, much more knowledgeable uh, in the tire and the equipment of the vehicle. And the moment they start looking, especially on European site, they would find that the Vredestein is always at the top of the test. Uh, always figure out to be the top five in any categories of product. We are, as most of the Dutch companies are, uh, an, a no-nonsense company as well. We don't dream about what is impossible, but uh, we do what is possible. And that's why, why we are spreading our wings out. Canadians like to complain about the winter, but yeah. you kind of like it, right? Oh, yes, we do, we do. The, the only difficult thing with winters, at least over here in Europe, is that you never know how long you will have a winter. Yeah. But what we are dreaming of is that we need two weeks of snow in November and two weeks of snow in January. And then our year is fantastic. You know what I stand for. Do you know what your car company stands for? More later on Kenzie's Corner. With Daiwoo dying an agonizingly slow death in North America, it left two products with no home. Enter Suzuki. It inherits the new Verona and the subject of this edition of Test Drive, the all-new Swift Plus. It's Suzuki's affiliation with General Motors, who also owns Daiwoo to all intents and purposes, that landed the company with two good and very much needed new products. We will test the mid-sized Verona on an upcoming test drive. As for the Swift Plus, well, it in a nutshell enters the marketplace at the bargain basement level, carrying an asking price of just $13,495 for the base car. Even the range-topping Swift Plus S tops out at an affordable $16,595. Now, given this very aggressive pricing strategy, you think there'd be very little to complain about? Well, think again. I know I'm going to sound like a broken record, but you know what? You cannot get anti-lock brakes on this Swift Plus, regardless of how much money you're prepared to spend. And that is a serious omission, primarily because this car's key competitor, the five-door Echo hatchback, well, anti-lock brakes are standard equipment. So even though this car is more affordable to begin with, by the time you factor in the lack of anti-lock brakes, well, that price advantage all but disappears. You know, it's time for Suzuki to get with the program. Power comes from a 1.6 litre double overhead cam engine that pushes out 105 horsepower and 107 pound-feet of torque at 3600 RPM. While the numbers as they appear on paper are a sure cure for insomnia, on the road, well pardon the pun, the Swift is pretty swift. True you're not going to burn off much more than the kid on his bike from a standstill but once up to speed it cruises quietly and it has enough power and reserve to pass a slower moving vehicle with safety. When power's at a premium, typically you don't want to go with the automatic transmission. However, with this Swift Plus, it doesn't make a whole pile of difference, primarily because the automatic transmission is smart. And unlike many other so-called adaptive transmissions, this thing learns very quickly. You hammer the gas pedal three or four times with authority, and it starts to stretch out the upshift points. The result? You lose very little in terms of performance. In fact, at the long lead, when I drove both the manual and automatic versions of the Swift, I actually preferred the automatic, and that doesn't happen very often. The Swift Plus also runs on little more than the smell of an oily rag. The official fuel economy numbers are 9 litres per 100 kilometres in the city and 6.4 on the highway. A week-long test brought an impressive average of 7.7 .7 litres per 100 kilometres, or 36.6 .6 miles per imperial gallon. The Swift also handles quite well for an entry-level car. With struts up front and a twist beam in back, it ran the pylons in a fairly unflustered manner. True, body roll is a constant companion, and understeer is never far behind, but when it comes to taking a faster corner, the little Swift hunkers down and pushes on through surprisingly well. The ride is also remarkably comfortable considering the rudimentary suspension design. You know, typically cars at this end of the price spectrum, you tend not to expect a great deal. In the Swift, 
Well, it's a very pleasant surprise because it's actually a nice place to spend time. Certainly there's acres of plastic, but you know what? It's not as cheap as many of its competitors. In fact, it's rather nice. You can also load this car up just about any way you want it. This one, for instance, it's got power locks, windows, mirrors, remote keyless entry, air conditioning, and a decent radio that not only plays CDs, it'll also play MP3s. You also get a spot for your sunglasses. About the only negative, the cup holders. If they're in use, they block the climate control, so you've got to remember to set them before you start driving. As for versatility, the Swift Plus is better than its immediate competition. The trunk will hold 1,190 litres of stuff when the 60-40 split folding seat backs are down. It's equally generous in the peace of mind department. Along with dual front airbags and three-point belts in all seating positions, it counts a five-year unlimited mileage roadside assistance program on its long bill of fare. You know, you get an awful lot of car for a very affordable dollar with this new Swift Plus. It's got enough power, it handles well, and it's very comfortable on a long trip. About the only thing to lament is the complete and utter lack of anti-lock brakes. On a day like today, when the roads are slippery and greasy, they add so much in terms of safety. On the subject of safety, if you ever get a hatchback, make sure it's got a rear wiper. It boils down to that old credo, see and be seen. You can be seen by turning your lights on, by using this wiper, you can see. Our Midas tip of the week concerns maintaining adequate fuel level for winter driving. There's a number of good reasons for running on the top half of your fuel tank during winter conditions. First of all, a trip that might take you an hour in good weather could take you two hours or more when you get a winter storm coming through. You don't want to get caught out on a limited access highway, have the traffic come to a stop and you can't reach the next exit before you run out of fuel. You do not want that to happen. Also, the added weight of a full tank of fuel will assist traction in most cases. Also, it helps to minimize condensation in the fuel system. And also, another tip that I can give you, every time you fuel your car up, reset that trip meter to zero. There's a bit of an issue with some makes and models of cars running out of fuel while the gauge incorrectly still reads maybe a quarter tank or more. Make sure you know the range of your vehicle, zero the trip meter, and when you get to about 60% of your normal range, get back in and fill her back up regardless of the reading on the gauge. That's your Midas tip of the week. We have integrated two wheel hub motors into an electric S10 vehicle. Uh, these motors are providing 25 kilowatts of power each and 500 newton meters of extra torque to this vehicle. And what's unique about these motors is that they are a direct drive gearless motor, so there's no gearbox. So the power coming out of the energy source in this particular application, a battery pack, is going directly to the wheel. So the capability that we are providing here is instant torque and instant acceleration. Our zero to 60 here is about nine seconds. Okay, this is a very, very heavy vehicle. It's got a battery pack that's, you know, a, a thousand pounds in it alone. So we think there's applications in hybrid vehicles that General Motors is going to be launching here in the very, very near future. Uh, and we feel that's a stepping stone until ultimately getting these things into a commercial fuel cell vehicle. We call it Car Star Starplex. What's unique is that it's the latest design in collision uh, repairs, uh, in uh, actual flow through of the work, and also in uh, latest equipment. Ready again? Three, two, one. Go! The car it belongs to myself. It's a 1998 Mercedes, and uh, we've invited the press here to show that uh, I have the confidence that if uh, my vehicle gets damaged by kickboxers, that uh, I have the confidence that it will be repaired properly and it'll, the cost containment will be right. The turnaround time, this vehicle, if the damage is under $2,000, we'll have it out in 72 hours. 
smashing a car with a hammer. That uh, that seemed to make a lot of sense. It, it's it's something maybe everybody should get a chance to do once in a while. It just kind of releases a lot of tension, preferably not on your own car. I have friends in the body shop business, and, and it kind of looks to me like they're going to do to small body shops what Costco has done to uh, hardware stores. On the other hand, this is a pretty tough business. It's uh, noisy, it's dirty, and if they can make it uh, cleaner and safer for people to get better body shops done, well, I guess maybe that's progress. That felt great. One of the problems in our industry is uh, uh, that it takes too long and also that the car is never ready when promised. We want to make sure that uh, if we promise you this vehicle will be done in three days, we'll give it back to you in three days. And no ifs and buts about it. You're not going to sell this car right after, right? Absolutely not. I have the confidence that this vehicle after repair will be just as good as brand new. And it's like any other kind of business, like root canal. Nobody wants it done, but when you have to have it done, you got to get it done. While the Rudestein Tire Company produces tires in Holland, it does not produce donuts, at least the rubber kind that are used as spare tires. But they do produce an inflatable spare tire. In fact, five years ago, they were producing about 45,000. That has now grown to well over 200,000. Now, how do these things work? Well, let's ask our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, the idea of the inflatable spare, or in some vehicles you have that high-pressure temporary spare, is to save your cargo space. Now, this sport utility's got a great cargo area, but you wouldn't want to use that up with the enormous full-size tires that are on the vehicle. So they use an inflatable spare below the uh, cargo deck at the back. Here it is here. And remember Camaros and Firebirds in the 70s and 80s? This is not new technology by any means. Those old Firebirds and Camaros, they had small wheels and tires on the vehicle, but a tiny trunk. So they used an inflatable tire, much like this one, and a canister that would charge it up. Now, let's talk about some of the generic information that you should know about changing a failed tire and wheel on the road. Now, I've stopped for a lot of people on the road and helped them change spare tires, and one thing I've noticed is that many times they stop the vehicle in a dangerous position. They haven't got it out of the path of traffic or into an area where it's safe to install a spare. And they're thinking, nine times out of ten, is that they don't want to ruin the tire or ruin the rim. Now, if that tire has deflated at highway speeds, it's almost a given that it's ruined. So don't worry about that. The rim, in most cases, will be okay as long as you keep the speed down. So if a tire fails at speed on the roadway, get it under control, get it slowed right down, and then continue at a low speed until you get to a ramp, a driveway, a broader area of the shoulder, somewhere where you can get that vehicle well out of harm's way and now change that failed tire. That's the number one consideration. Then get your owner's manual out and follow the instructions carefully. Remember things like breaking loose the wheel bolts before you jack it up. That's very important too, but your, your owner's manual will walk you through these instructions and it's not a bad idea to do a dry run someday when the weather's really good in your driveway, just so that you understand all the equipment and all the procedure involved. Now, one thing that I did notice about when we read the owner's manual for the Turag, in this particular case with the inflatable spare tire, it's only suitable for use on the rear axle of this particular vehicle. So there's a little bit of a problem. If you get a flat on the front, you've got to jack the back up, take a good wheel off the back, install the spare on the back. Once it's bolted down, you charge, up, charge it up, inflate it, and it expands to its full diameter. Then you've got to let the back end down, take the good tire you took off the back, the full-size tire and wheel, go up to the front, jack it up, take your failed tire off the front, and move one of the rear tires to the front. That's a lot of maneuvering, and I can't see a lot of people being able to handle that. And You know, Murphy's Law being what it is, you never get a flat on a good day. It's either dark, raining, snowing, or something. So I think you'd better think seriously about getting the CAA membership, boys. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2004. A high school buddy of mine used to say that his Dodge should have had a Motomaster badge on it because by the time he fixed it, there was more Canadian tire parts in it than there was Chrysler parts. Well, you know, that's not unlike modern cars. 
Magna, Lear, Bosch, and ZF, they all supply lots of components to modern cars. But who's going to buy a car that's got Bosch on the hood? So the car companies establish these brands, try to get the public to understand that certain attributes go with these brands. If you associate with those brands, you buy the car. Take Saab, for example, maybe not the best known brand in the world, but it has a pretty strong brand image. Aircraft related, lightweight, front wheel drive, key on the floor. So what's the next model going to be? A Chevy Trailblazer SUV with a Saab badge on the hood. What's that got anything to do with anything Saab has ever stood for? You've got Porsche, lightweight sports cars that win at Le Mans, right? Their current vehicle, a joint venture with Volkswagen to build a 6,000 pound truck. Excuse me, I don't get it. Now the car companies say they got to leverage their global corporate assets. They've got to expand the brand to cover off all the marketplace. The Saab dealers are whining because everybody's got an SUV except them. But soon, down the road, you have no brand image. If everybody's building a car for every market segment, what's the difference between a Saab and a Porsche and a Chevy and a Ford? There is no difference. So five years down the road, there are no brands. Everything's the same. I don't get it. But then again, the guys that are making these decisions are getting paid a whole lot more than I am for criticizing them. I'm Jim Kenzie. The Vredestein Tire Company in Holland produces about four and a half million tires a year. Not a lot when you consider that a company like Michelin does that in a week. But you know, there is one market this Dutch company has yet to exploit, and it's the biggest market in North America, that being the sport utility. But you can bet if there's money to be made, this company will soon be a player. Now, they're definitely a player when it comes to bicycle tires, and they tell me there are more bicycles in Holland than people. The question is, how do you find your bike at the end of the day? That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Brad, Jim, Bill, who needs those guys? I think motoring needs an all new look. What do you think, ladies? That's right, Graham. TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, total car care. We do that. <laughs>